If you can hear them and stop them consciously, say, no, uh, uh, change the belief right there. Just give the more positive thing. As you repeat this more frequently and you keep repeating it, the subconscious mind begins to learn. So as a habit, if okay. you stay conscious and you have to work at it, and, and here's why people say, well, how come only 5% from conscious mind, 95 for, from subconscious? Because a conscious mind can think into the future and think into the past and solve problems, then think about it yourself. Most of the time, you're thinking about something. Well, if you're thinking, you're using the conscious mind. Well, if you're using the conscious mind for thinking, then who's running the show? And the answer is, when you're not paying attention and you're thinking about what I'm going to do tomorrow, your subconscious is running the so show. So you use the words, be present. Be present. Which be we, mindful. we hear a lot. So be mindful, which really means be aware yes. of what's going on, what, so you get an automatic reaction, you're aware of that, and you say, I don't want to go there, that's an old pattern, and you look at a new way to be in that situation. Exactly, and okay. you have to repeat it over and over again, yeah. because if you think, well, I, I, I got mad at myself yesterday because I repeated that same stupid thing, and I got mad again today because I repeated the same stupid thing, and then people give up because they get frustrated, and it's like, no, no, it's a habit. So you have to every day, but ultimately, you can repeat it, yet there are... Fortunately, now very many new healing modalities that uh, that can help you rewrite the subconscious beliefs much faster. So uh, I get very excited because uh, some of this may take work for people because you have to really be present. And yet we're so bombarded with information and our lives are so busy that our conscious mind is almost always wandering trying to resolve issues and problems and things we have to work out, which then means the subconscious mind is running the show. Yeah. Uh, and it's very interesting because most people will be very familiar with this story. I tell it to my audiences and they all laugh because they're familiar with it. I say, look, you have a very close friend. You know your friend's behavior. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And at some point you see that your friend shares the same behavior as their parent. So you, you, know, you casually volunteer, you go, you know, Bill, you're just like your dad. And that's when you have to back away from Bill, <laughs> uh, because Bill's the first guy that says, how can you compare me to my dad? And everyone laughs because they're familiar, uh, but I say, uh, no, there's two very profound points from that one story, and profound point number one. Everybody else can see that Bill behaves like his dad. He got his programming from his dad. It's only Bill who doesn't see it. Yeah. And profound point number two, we're all Bill, because all of us got programming, and all of us operate with these programs and we don't even see we're doing it, that we even when told we're doing it will deny that we do these behaviors because we don't even see what we're doing. That's why it's called subconscious below conscious. Because you went from, and I'm quoting from your book, wanting to be anyone but me. Yes. To being, I think you quote yourself as the happiest man in the world. You felt so happy. Oh so my gosh. So you proved that this can work. Well, I had to because I said when I first started talking about it, it was from an academic conscious point of view. This is what I learned. But my subconscious programs are still exactly the same. So, yeah. well, I had this wonderful knowledge. My life still wasn't anything I wanted to, to brag about it because it wasn't. And, uh, and as you know, that old game, well, who would you like to be? And I could think of anybody I'd rather be than me. And yet, when I started to apply the new science and rewrite the subconscious so it supported me rather than the programs of limitation or disempowerment that we get from our parents and our community as children, which almost all of us get, when I put in the new programs, all of a sudden I started to find, my goodness, my life completely turned around. Uh, all wonderful things started happening in my life. I was healthier. I haven't been to a doctor in 20 years. I, I, I don't need that. I don't take any of their drugs. Why? Because most of the illness is just from the stress of not living in harmony. Mm -hmm. And when you learn to, to get rid of the limiting programs that we got as children and put in programs that support you, guess what? Then all of a sudden, the place turns into heaven. Uh, and it's interesting, people, I tell people, well, you create your own life, and then they look around and go, oh, I don't want responsibility for this. But I say, well, you didn't know you were creating with these unconscious beliefs. And, uh, and yet then I tell people, especially people that have fallen in love, and the people have fallen head over heels in love. I said, go back to that time when you first fell in love. Uh, let me ask you a question. Were you healthy? And it, oh, yeah, I was, I was healthy as anything. I said, you have energy? I said, oh, I had so much energy. Made love for days in a row without even eating. And I go, yeah. And I go, uh, and how was life for you? It was so exciting. I couldn't wait for the next day. So I said, in this little period that, you, you know, that I refer to as a honeymoon, I say, wasn't life like heaven on earth? And they go, well, yeah. And I go, you know, that was not an accident. That was an actual creation. And you say, but what was different that made life uh, uh, so heaven on earth during love? And the answer is, 
because you become very self-conscious of yourself. You don't rely on the habits. The day before you meet this person, you're going to go on a date. I say, especially to women, I say, how long did it take you to get dressed? And they say, well, it was 15 minutes and I was out of the house. And then I say, now, tonight, you're going to go on a date with this person who has just rocked your world. And I say, how long did it take you to get dressed? It's like, my God, it may take an hour or two. And I say, yesterday, 15 minutes. Today, an hour or two. What's the difference? Yesterday, I got dressed by habit because I get dressed every day. Yeah. But tonight, I am looking in the mirror, meaning I am self conscious. I am making sure that I represent myself to be the fully the best individual I can be. And when both parties are not relying on the habit, and both of them are saying, I'm creating the best I can be, they're living in the moment of the now, they're being very mindful, they're being very present, and guess what? Heaven on earth is created. But unfortunately, uh, life gets busy. It's hard and, to stay present. And they're present. meeting as well. They're truly meeting. Oh, yeah, which yeah. Which is also very rare, unfortunately. Well, and, and why is that important? Because it did demonstrate that you did create this period, yeah. and it's available to you all the time if you knew how not to get stuck in the old habits. Well, one of the things that I really found fascinating in, in, in your book is the fact we, we all have approximately 50 trillion cells in our body, and these cells are all self-sufficient. They have their own memory, they have their own you know, immune system, and in fact, you also go on to say that for 2.75 billion years, there was only one-celled organisms on the alive planet. on the planet. Yeah. And, and, and the nature is, as a single cell evolved to be the most intelligent it could be, it ran into a physical limitation because intelligence is physically tied up with the membrane or skin of the cell. You can only have so much membrane. Uh, so evolution apparently stopped. It was like two and a half billion years, just a single cell organism. Then they said, well, how can you have more evolution? The answer is cells decided to come together in community because when cells come into community, they share awareness. So there's more awareness with 10 cells than there is with one cell. And there's more awareness with a million or a billion or a trillion. So when you look at a human being, while we see ourselves as single entities, the truth is we are made out of 50 trillion amoeba-like cells and so our body is this giant community. Uh, and what, what makes it very exciting, as you mentioned, is, well, in my own work with cloning cells, I can take a cell out of your body and it can live outside of you. Why? It has its own intelligence. It has, essentially, every function in your body is present in a cell. So my seven-year-old vision manifests to be true when I got older to realize cells are miniature people. And then you say, well, what about happens in a human body? And I go, this is where the issue comes in. It's because you have 50 trillion cells living in community, but your mind is the government. When a government works in harmony with the people, then the people thrive and the community is, is in good health and grows. But when a government is not really supportive or not working in, in harmony with a community, then the government can cause the, the, the nature of that community to fall apart or even lead to, to, to the end of the community. Well, that's what we're finding out. Our mind is the government. And when we entertain harmony and, and the right living and balance with nature and with each other, then we provide our 50 trillion cells with very life-supporting information and chemistry. So harmony means giving the body good food? Yes. Not being stressed out? Absolutely. Living in a, in a happy environment? Yes. Uh, it basically it says, uh, it, it's as I said, when I had my petri dish of cells, if I put it from a healthy environment to a bad environment, the cells got sick. But you didn't have to give them drugs. Uh, but all you did is take the, the dish from the bad environment and put it in a good environment. And, and the joke which I like to tell people is, well, this happens in a plastic petri dish, but guess what? We are skin-covered petri dishes. Underneath our skin is 50 trillion cells living in a dish, and the culture medium is the blood. And so when I change the culture medium in a plastic dish, I change the fate of the cells. And I say, well, then what controls the culture medium? My blood, the chemistry. And the answer is, my thoughts influence my brain, and the brain releases chemistry that matches my thoughts. So when I'm in stress, or I'm afraid of the world, I release different chemistry into the blood than if I open up my eyes and I find myself in love, I release completely different chemistry. And it's like, well, I, all I have to ask an individual is, how do you feel when you're in total love, or how do you feel when you're in fear? And the answer is, well, I feel totally different. And guess what? All the cells are bathed in that chemistry. And so the, the feeling of love produces totally different chemistry in the blood, chemistry that supports growth and healing of the body and supports the immune system. And in contrast, 
when we perceive reasons to be afraid and we release stress hormones into our body, we actually shut off the growth mechanisms and the immune system to, serve, to save the energy. Why? Because if you believe you're going to have to run from that lion, you want all the energy available to run from a lion. So when a person is in stress, they allocate their energy reserves for fight or flight but take it at the expense of the health of the system, the immune part of the system. And so the more stress you're under, the more bad chemistry in a sense of not supporting you, you that you experience. Uh, and, and it was a very important point. In our evolution, stress or fear was not the mainstay of life. The mainstay of life was to be happy and live in the harmony of the environment. Every now and then a saber-toothed tiger would come. Okay, now it's time to be stressed out. Now it's time to run. But the point is, once you escape from the saber-toothed tiger in the old days, then it's like, oh, back to health and harmony. And I say, well, what about in today's world? Today's world is 24-7 run from the tiger. And this is not biologically sustainable because uh, the chemistry of protection uh, uh, contrasts with the chemistry of growth. Yeah, it's interesting how the body, you point this out in Spontaneous Evolution, your second book, that how the body also is a snapshot of how we are as a human race. Oh, absolutely, because um, what you, we would see from a new understanding of evolution, which is a great extension beyond the Darwinian belief, belief which is quite limiting, okay, and quite troublesome, in fact. Uh, because just think about what the principal Darwinian belief is, uh, that evolution is based on a struggle for survival with a competition for fitness. So that says, oh my God, then our world is, we're all out there in a dog-eat-dog -dog rat race trying to survive because if you stop running, the person behind you is going to run over you. So if that's your way of life, then every day, by definition, you are living in a, a stress hormone uh, body because of all the fears that we, that we have. And yet evolution says, no, evolution is based on community and cooperation. A body has 50 trillion citizens. They live in harmony with each other. And it turns out that every human being we're beginning to find out is like a cell in a...